Hey, it's Mark Podolsky, The Land Geek, with your favorite niche real estate website, www.thelandgeek.com. And before we talk about today's really cool, geeky guest, I want to introduce my co-host, Six Sigma. You know him. You love him. Scott Todd from scotttodd.net, landmodo.com. And look, if you are not automating your Craigslist listings, I don't know why, go to postingdomination.com forward slash the land geek. Today's podcast is sponsored by Loan Geek. Automate your payments with Loan Geek. All right, it's Mark Podolsky, the land geek from landgeek.com. Um, Scott, are you excited for today's guest? I am. I got to tell you, that, that Lone Geek commercial, you really need to get that thing uh, like really produced well. I really do. <laughs> I've got a lot of problems with it. I really it's do. bad. It's bad. All right. Our, you know, our, I'm actually signing up to Lone Geek right now because I thought it was so compelling. I'm not sure. Oh, okay. Oh, I, I <laughs> Mark P, I stand corrected. By the, by the <laughs> way, our, our guest has published four books, including an international bestseller, Scott Todd. How many yeah. published? Yeah, I mean. I just okay. dropped the mic on you. You, you yeah, did. I you just did. dropped that mic because in 2008, while studying at a little known university called Stanford, my niche decided to take a little trip abroad, a little trip that lasted five years. He lived in Italy, Spain, Argentina, Brazil, India, Mexico, Colombia, Germany, Sweden, and many more. And since then, he's made it his life goal to show others that there is another way to experience the world. It's never been easier to live your dream. And uh, Manish Sethi from pavlok.com, P-A-V-L-O-K.com, exactly. is going to make our lives better, right? Because I hope so. I, no, well, I'll, I'll tell you why. I, I know for sure you're, you're going to make my life better. And I'll, here, here's a good example, okay? Um, by the way, Manish, welcome to Art of Passive Income Hi. podcast. <laughs> um, okay, here, here's a good example. We are all addicted to these things right? Our, our phones, our smartphones. I'm, I'm, I'm not even kidding. Like my children are addicted to their phones. I take them to school and I have to yell at them, put your phones away. Okay. Now, am I a hypocrite? Absolutely. I'm a hypocrite because they've seen me on my phone all the time, right? Honestly, it's a little dopamine hit every time I check email. They get a good email, they get a bad email. I'm really trying to stick to a plan of checking it twice a day. Don't check it first thing in the morning. Don't check it at night. Scott, do you have the same problem? Oh, man, I do. And like right, right now as you're saying that, I, I see um, I've got the, the Gmail tabs opened up on my browser and the numbers are calling me. Like right? I just saw them go up and I'm like, it's killing me. It's bad. Yeah, yeah. I, so I, I, hate the, I, I hate the not having control, right? So if I, can, if I could change this habit, because it's basically a habit, right? So Manish, help me. Help me change this. So the first thing I'll start off by saying is I don't do email. Um, I don't do email. So I haven't done, I don't go into email. I don't go into Gmail. I don't respond to emails. Uh, but emails get responded to by me because I have a team of people who answer email on my behalf. Um, and so for that reason, it's like the first thing that pops in my mind with regards to email specifically is that you don't have to do email. There's ways around it. That's give, cool me the, give me an example. Okay, so this is a funny story. I'll give you my email story. Um, so I started off doing a, a lot of emails and I never get through it and I always feel bad about it. And then I started to try to do inbox zero, but then I don't do it well and then I feel bad, which is dumb. Um, because email is just somebody else putting a to-do list item on your plate. Um, and so I started off by realizing that this was a problem. And I hired my first virtual assistant um, when I started Pavlock like in, in 2013. And I found that when you enter email, like when you go into email, you get stuck. And then that's like the rest of the day, all you think about is closing those loops. So as long as you never enter email, you can stay out of it. So I worked with him on developing a system to make it so I never had to enter email. Um, he we basically set it up so he would go through and tag everything that in like four categories. One was like handle this Manish. One was like, I think it's the archive. One was like promotions and something else. And then um, he, I wrote a little script that he hit go and the script would copy all the emails information into a Google spreadsheet with an extra 
row, extra column for Caleb's expected response. And then he would write a response, a sample response to it. And so in the morning on my walk to work, I would usually do a phone call with him or I would just review it on the phone and be like, I would just look at all the list of his, uh, his responses. And then I would edit it if I wanted it to be changed and then say, then approve them all. And then he would send them all out. And so the first thing that happened is it made it really rapidly quick that I only needed to answer like 10 or 11 instead of answering all of them. And I would do it on Google spreadsheets. So I never had to go back in. And then more, more and more over time, he got really good at it. And I, I stopped asking and it just, it became one of those things that just happened naturally. Right? So this is where the story gets funny. Um, about that. So I give a talk on this, on exactly this uh, system at South by Southwest two years ago. And uh, one year ago, about nine months ago, I remember having a conversation where someone was talking about email and I'm like, yo, I don't do email. And they're like, what do you mean? And I totally forgot about my virtual assistant. And I was like, you know, it's interesting. Like every time I pop in my email box, there's only like 10 or 20 or 30 emails. You know, the truth is if you don't send out emails, emails don't get sent to you. It's just like a system. If you just stop responding. And I actually believe this. And I found out three months later that my assistant had been going in answering a hundred plus emails a day as me that I didn't even notice and totally forgot about. And that I just believed that it was working on its own, like a magical process. But anyway, long story short, there are ways around email and there are ways around all these little things. But the truth is that like the way that we live in our society makes us believe that these numbers that have red dots on them on your phone must be completed until they're ticked down to zero. And the first thing is to realize that none of that's true. That you can step away and say, my phone is designed to serve me. I'm not designed to serve my phone. And that's the first thing to realize that you're allowed to have power and you're allowed to say no. That's the, the hardest thing. It's all mindset. Yeah, that's my story. <laughs> Scott, how do you feel? So, I mean, like, so how, how is your team communicating with you? Uh, we communicate typically over Slack right now. Okay. So, so your, your team's not, not sending you email. The, the email is really coming from external sources. Yeah. And that's, that's, I mean, so you, I mean, so you, in a way you've just moved some communication over to Slack as opposed to um, really just communicating with your team in email. Oh yeah. Yeah. So like, you got to understand that like this is, so this was pre team. This was pre Slack 2013. I didn't have Slack yet. Um, but I didn't really have a big team at that time. Um, there are types of people, there's categories of people, right? There's like your boss, you need to respond to fast. And then there's like your, the person who's reporting to you, who you can be a little slower with. And then there's people who are possible promotional partners who might be like, it might be a really big deal to respond to them. You might like lose an opportunity if you don't but also you don't have to. Um, so like one big thing I've understood is that uh, if you accept the fact that you will not get to inbox zero or you won't answer every email, then you are also expressing the fact that you are accepting the possibility of, of losing an opportunity. So there are certainly opportunities that I have missed because I didn't respond to email. There are big opportunities that I've missed by not responding to email, but I think that the fact that I don't have email running my life is worth it versus the idea of possibly missing some possible uh, outcome. If that makes sense. So with regards to chat and Slack, I mean, here's the thing. I'm different than most people. Um, like on a personality type scale or on like the, the big five, my uh, conscientiousness level, the act of finishing what I start uh, is in the bottom second percentile. I'm severely ADD, I have a terrible lack of focus, and I have no real ability to execute or finish things that I start. Um, so what I've learned over time is that rather than fighting that, I can surround myself with people who do it, who get stuff done and feel uncomfortable leaving stuff undone. And that allows me the freedom to focus on my strengths and do things like idea generation, partners, um, work, I travel, working with people and meeting people at conferences and setting up affiliate deals, but not closing them. Um, making myself be a lead generator, making myself use my strengths rather than focusing on trying to fix the things that make me uncomfortable. Uh, you know, you know, it's funny, Manish, when you say that, I actually think it's a strength because that's, uh, what? 
Well, the fact that you can't execute and that, you ha- that it forces you, that you have the awareness to know, hey, I've got business ADD, right? So I need to find these people that are super uncomfortable leaving these things unresolved. Yeah. That's, to me, that's the definition of an entrepreneur. An entrepreneur lets go. They delegate. Yeah. They find people smarter and more capable than themselves so they can go on and keep building more ideas and working on the business as, as opposed to being like a manager in the business. Um, you could argue that uh, Steve Jobs, for example, not a great entrepreneur, a phenomenal manager, right? This guy was so detailed that you couldn't even do a, like, the, the, you know, the, the, like a font would have to go through him and he would have to approve it, right? He might, and, but incredible, may, may arguably the best ever, right? But most people yeah. like Steve Jobs, this, this like once in a generation genius, right? But- so I actually, I actually argue exactly the opposite about Steve Jobs specifically. Um, Steve Jobs, while he was like hyper-focused and hyper-critical on specific things related to design. Are you, can you hear me? Mm-hmm. You yeah. losing me? I, I got you. We got you. We got you. Can you hear us? I think Manish lost us, Scott. Okay, I'm back. Are you here? Oh, yeah. yeah. There we go. Oh, sorry about that. So with regards to Steve Jobs himself, um, I think that Steve Jobs is, so first of all, he's, he's my personality type, the, the type of um, non-finisher, more starter, but he trained himself through like years of focus meditation. Um, and you'll notice his, in, at the beginning stages of his company um, with Next, uh, he got fired from his own company. And he got fired because he was starting too many projects without having a clear goal or having clear systems of success. Um, I think we lost Manish again. I think of, so. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, he got I, 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 There is a. Uh, I mean, he brought up a. He brought up Steve Hello, Jobs. Yeah. Oh, hey guys, I'm sorry about this. Uh, I, I just turned off my video. Hopefully, this will be a little faster. Okay. Uh, um, what were you saying? I was going to say, I, I think that you, you bring up a compelling point. The fact that Steve, you know, Steve Jobs, he might have, he might have had the same personality type as you and he maybe didn't realize that at the time that's what led to, to his termination at Apple. Um, and the fact that, you know, as you get older, you start to, and, and more mature, you start to identify like, okay, I, I can build a team around me. I can't, I don't have to micromanage everything. I don't have to, I can get people that can help me play into to my to, to build up my, my uh, weaknesses. Right. So yeah, that I become yeah. a stronger individual and a stronger leader. I think there's some, there is something to that, to that component because it's, it is really hard to take a project all the way from, from, mm-hmm. you know, idea generation all the way to the finish line. It, it's really, it, it's, I think it's, I mean, it, it takes a rare person to be able to do that. Well, what I- I've noticed too is like, so if you look at people who, um, so when I look at, I look at things through a filter of personality types often. Um, and I don't believe that personality types are correct. And I don't believe that they're the like secret or that they're magic. I believe that you can categorize people in any set of boxes using any set of criteria. And that, that there are some that already exist that are pretty good. And like Myers-Briggs is a good set of criteria that categorizes people that allows you to have boxes of people, some in the corner, some in the center, and gives you a common vocabulary that you can talk about people in a, in a, in a compelling way. Um, and so when I look at people who are executors, so if you look at, um, so, so the Myers-Briggs type for, for um, Steve Jobs, ENTP, and the type for both Tim Cook and Bill Gates was an ENTJ. Um, their type is a finisher. They're the extroverted, big idea people who execute and get stuff done. Bill Gates started off as a programmer. He was a kid who started programming, right? And then he took his idea of programming and he killed it. He had one idea and he massacred that idea and he made that idea perfect across the entire world. And Bill Gates is, this, is, is amazing. Um, but you look at Tim Cook, same type. Uh, Tim Cook is one of the world's best at vertical integration. His ability to, to create a, a manufactured product line is unrivaled. Um, but what happens with the, with people who are executors is that they, uh, how do I explain this in a better way? People who execute don't always see the bigger picture. And, um, and, um, so when you look at the, the, the act of finishing what you start, the personality trait for, for execution, it's highly correlated with almost everything good. You'll live longer. You won't get divorced. You won't do drugs. You'll make more money. 
but it's inversely correlated with just one thing that's positive. And that one thing is creativity. And this was one of the biggest breakthroughs I ever had in my own, for my own personal self growth was that focus by definition is the opposite of creativity. That one who executes to, at the same time as finishing what they start, they are by definition turning off their mind to open up to possibility of things they could do. That when you do what you're supposed to do, when you do one thing, you're not doing other things. And that in American society is a good, is a, um, in American society, the act of focus is a heavy positive. But if everybody was a finisher, there wouldn't be the, the starters, there, there wouldn't be the good ideas that got us here in the first place. Uh, Scott, I, I kind of agree. I mean, I mean, it's weird. It's kind of counterintuitive, but it's just, it's the thing that I've been developing over years. It was uh, the end of my own self-hatred. And I wish I, I'm going to turn my video right now because it helps when I like can gesticulate. But um, like the, yeah, I, I know it's kind of crazy, but one thing that re- it's crazy to me is that, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I, one thing that's crazy to me is that there's this hyper focus on focus as a good thing, but no one ever takes a step back to think about what, it, what that means. Like why is ADHD considered a disorder? when it's not a disorder, it's a personality trait. And people who are ADHD are the best at sales. They're the best at, like salesmen ha- are, are not focusers. They're guys who are good at thinking on their feet. The act of finishing at that time is not, a, and so, what, what, but what happens is there aren't, there is not one person. There's a lot of different types of people, but when we tell people from young, young age that you should be, if you don't finish what you're doing, you're bad. And if you don't get to work on time or get to school on time, you're not just wrong, but you're morally wrong. It makes, and you, you have a disorder. It makes people think that they're broken without taking the time back to the step back to see where are my skills better suited. Very interesting. So Manish, do you have children? Oh gosh, I hope not. No, I don't have children. <laughs> None that you know about. Okay. <laughs> because this is, you know, as a parent, this is something that is really difficult to let go of. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, number one, the awareness of it. So now that we're aware that this, Hey, it's okay to kind of, you know, like you, you get something out of not having this tremendous amount of focus. Like maybe I can accept, you know, this, this child as being creative, but society, the teachers, everyone's kind of saying to you and you're, you're competing against the neighbor. Right. Mm-hmm. And you want to put them into that box. Right. Mm-hmm. And then you, then you get, a, you know, Uncle Manish says, hey, look, nothing wrong here. This is a strength. You got to look at it from a different lens, right? So, so how, do you, how do you reconcile culture and upbringing and breaking out of that, having that mindset, having that, that openness and that awareness so that we can, I hate to use the word focus, but, you know, focus on yeah. our strengths to break through and get to our, our best life, let's say. Sure. Is, I, so the first, the first, Scott, am I getting yeah. too woo woo for you? No. All right. No, I'm good. Hey, yeah, no, and I, and I, I know I, I love that at least one of you guys isn't, isn't like <laughs> scared. Like, I know it's crazy. The stuff I talk about is often weird, and it's, it, it only, it, it's only because I grew up with, a, with massive ADHD, being told ever since I was a kid that I was broken, being told that I had a disorder, yet somehow being able to get good grades and pull off, you know, things that I pulled off. And, um, and I think the one word you used there that was the most interesting to me, uh, Mark was culture. So American culture is very, very, very different from any other country. Um, and as I traveled, I started to notice this more and more in Italy, you don't show up on time. In India, you never show up on time. On time is one hour late. And you think in Jamaica, if someone doesn't get to class on time, that their, their, their parents are like, you don't even get to class on time. That's not how it is. American culture evolved in its own very weird way. And there's a long story process behind why American culture is as it is. And nothing at all is wrong with it. It just is. American culture does, um, I mean, obviously America has done incredible things. I mean, I think America is one of the most amazing places to live ever 
And, uh, and, you know, we have the most innovative people on this, like the, the fear of failure doesn't exist because failure is a good thing in America and that doesn't exist anywhere else. And it's really hard to be entrepreneurial in other countries when other people tell you you're wrong. Whereas here, if I talk about getting a job, my friends will make fun of me. Like that doesn't exist in other countries. And that's a great thing. But American culture teaches you that X is X and Y is Y and that's how it should be. And if you don't do it that way, then you have chemical imbalance in the brain and you need to go to a doctor for it. And that doctor won't even ask you about your exercise habits or your sleep habits. They'll just prescribe you a pill to fix the problem. And that is a bad side of the culture. And uh, in my opinion, uh, and I think that the trick here is to understand that the, that the culture of America is, um, I don't know, I've been thinking about this a lot, Mark. I've been thinking a lot about the influence of culture plus personality type on human behavior. Um, all I do is I think about human behavior. That's what I do. And uh, I focus on it. My company focuses on it. We help people break their bad habits and form their good habits and achieve their goals. And it's all fucking crazy because there's no reason why people shouldn't achieve goals if you think about it rationally, right? It's like, yo, I want to go to the gym. I want to be healthy. Why don't I go to the gym? Right. There's like a million reasons why, but there's just human behavior gets in the way. So I look at it and I see um, I see that there's like this this massive problem where in America, people think that this is how things are, that there are only two parties and the two party system is how it is. There's only the act of you sh should get stuff done. And if you don't, you're broken. And I don't think that there is a way for one person to fix it. I mean, I'm working my ass off trying to solve this problem. But I think that like, if you're looking at it from a parent perspective, which I think you asked me, the, the question was from a parent perspective. Well, you know, from a parenting perspective, or, or if you're a child, or if you're a teenager, or if you're a young adult, right? And you're the, you're the one being bombarded by culture. Yeah. Culture saying, hey, there's something wrong with you. Yeah. That doesn't feel good. And you've, you've experienced it. And I think it's a really refreshing perspective. Like, no, nothing wrong with you. Nothing wrong with you. Let me give you a good example. When I was a kid, uh, my mom is like obsessive compulsive. And uh, it was me with her for five years, us two alone. Um, I mean, my dad was there too. But my mom and I would get on, like, we were not close. I mean, we would fight all the time. She would be nagging me. The, the one thing she made me so angry, or the one thing that we would fight about all the time was the fact that every time I was at dinner, I would be um, like hitting the table and like, making things like fidgeting and playing like on the table and she, we would get into huge fights about this all the time and when I went to college and I, I started to like see this perspective that I'm talking about now what I did was I started to become a drummer I started playing music in the Stanford band and that was like a big click it was a big breakthrough for me that like my mom could have instead of instead of telling me stop it stop it stop it sit down stop making music stop it sit down focus she could have been like hey maybe I should get you a drum set you know, like you're playing drums on the table. Why don't I get you a drum, a drum set to play on? Um, and there's nothing, you know, I mean, I'm, there's nothing against my mom here. This is, you know, that's, that's not what I'm trying to get at. I love her. But um, that idea of, uh, of, of if you don't do what I expect you to do, then you are in trouble. Should sometimes, instead of being like sumo wrestled, sometimes we should judo it. Sometimes we should say, what is... Like, what's the deeper system behind what's going on here? And how can we re, like, how can we use the strengths that you have to help benefit you rather than making you feel bad because you don't do what everybody in the box does? So and, how, and, and, sorry, good. I was gonna say, how, how do you apply that? Like, um, like, how would you apply that or you know, send the message to whether it's a teenager or you know, a college student, someone in school? I mean, like, and I think that's where Mark's question is coming from. Like in school, you, you're told like, this is the way that it's supposed to be. But in school, you, you, you the, the school goals may not line up to your goals, right? Like, but you got to still, comp you still have to comply. It's the same way with the work too, right? Like if I, if I'm not an entrepreneur, man, I, I gotta, I gotta deliver what the company, what the company says. Yeah. Well, so the first thing to take, so those are two different questions. So with, within school, if you're talking about a student in school who's listening to this podcast right now, who's like me and having trouble finishing stuff and they're like, Oh my God, maybe Manish is like, like got this great idea. Uh, maybe I should just stop going to school. Like that's not the solution. Um, the solution for that is how can I um, finish goals? What are the things that motivate me that don't motivate most people? Okay. So I'll, I'll come back to that answer in a second. Um, the second question you had is uh, if you are a, uh, a parent 
and how can you motivate your kids? That's a different question. So if you're a kid and you want to fix the problem, I'll, I'll start off with this. Um, so, oh, and, and I'm sorry, the second question you had was if I have a boss who wants me to do something, yeah, right. how do I fix that problem? So the first question, the first answer is there are things that motivate people. Obviously I finish stuff, right? Like I get stuff done when it's necessary, but I'm motivated by different things than regular people. So uh, people, whenever I went on like boards or books that are like, here's how to get productivity done. They'd be like, break down your task into manageable steps and then work on one step and then check off the box and you'll feel comfortable when you check off the box. And the definition of a, of a, non, a non-finisher, of a perceiver versus a finisher is that they feel uncomfortable finishing stuff. They feel uncomfortable checking off that box. So that thing doesn't work because I literally get ill. Like I get sick, like I, I, my stomach turns when I'm hitting the send button on an email. It fucking hurts. So instead, what does motivate people like me? It's bets and accountability. It's competition and accountability. So somebody else competing with me saying, hey, I bet you can't do this. Fuck you, I will do it. Um, like you, you mentioned, Mark, about the book that I wrote when I was 13, the, the international bestseller, uh, Game Programming for Teens, right? Right. So, I went to this game programming conference where my hero had like this new conference thing on how to make video games. And they had this like book place where they were like, we're going to let new people write books. And so I went up and I wrote a a message on the board, the message board the next day saying, Hey, uh, I'm like a 13 year old kid. I was there. It was really exciting. Um, I think I maybe could write a book on game programming for kids. What do you think someday? And this author guy replied back saying, I'll never hire anybody who's young than 25 you're too dumb you're too stupid you'll never stick through with it and you won't get it done and i was like fuck this guy and in the next four days i wrote 80 pages of the book i sent it above his head pretending to be an adult got a book contract signed got the deal signed 80 pages in four days and the next 160 pages took 1.5 years because the competition aspect got it done and so what I've realized is that that's not a problem. I always get stuff done on the deadline. Every email, every, every like uh, college essay got done two minutes before or less that it was due. So how can I make actual deadlines exist? I created a betting system with my friends and now it's kind of engendered in our app where it's like, uh, if I don't do X, then I have to donate money to a charity I don't approve of, right? That motivates me like none other. If I don't go to the gym, then my, my friend James Swanick, who, Fuck that guy. I love him, but fuck him. Gets my money. Uh, hey, <laughs> like my no, I, think, I think what's interesting though is it, let's segue into Pavlock then because based on, on what you're saying, you're like, look, for these people that need habit change, don't read a self-help book. Don't make a to-do list. Have some operant conditioning in your life. So let's, yeah. talk, let's, let's talk about Pavlock. Yeah. I'll come right back to Pavlock in 10 seconds. I just want to close the loop with one thing that, um, that I, was, I was asked by Scott Nate, about. If, if, we, if we close it, then you're not going to feel comfortable. And I want you to feel comfortable. No, I know, I know. I just want, I know, I know he's going to feel uncomfortable. Um, and uh, extroverted feeling. I got to make everybody happy. I'll close really quickly. And that is, if you are having trouble with your job and you, you find yourself in a finisher job, but you're a starter, you need to move away and get to another job. And I'm going to come back to this when I talk about my tip of the week, which involves identifying who you are before you, you let yourself feel bad. Okay. So what you were saying with regards to Pavlock, right? I'll take a step back and say, um, I was just talking about bets and then I talked about accountability and, um, my old blog, which you mentioned, uh, hack the system, which was where I think we talked about before. Um, this was the blog that helped me launch Pavlock. It was, uh, my, my job for five years as I traveled. Uh, I, I started to do experiments on my own productivity. And I did two experiments, which changed my life. The first one was uh, betting, the bet switch mechanism. So I make bets to lose weight and somehow I would always lose the weight, right? And the second one was accountability. I started to think to myself, okay, I'm having trouble getting writing done. Like I'm supposed to write two articles a week, yet I find myself writing zero. And what's up with that? I have nothing else to do in my life. Why am I not writing? Because I'm addicted to Facebook and Twitter, right? Um, And so what was interesting is that... uh, I thought to myself, how could I solve this problem? And I asked my friends and I read the books and they were like, break it down into smaller ways and then sit down and check it off at each step and write an outline. And I was like, this sounds stupid. What if instead I just had somebody follow me around all day and make me do it? Like you tell me, uh, Mark, like if you had somebody follow you around, if you committed to doing some tasks at the beginning of the week and then somebody just stood there, would you do the tasks at some point? Manish, I hire uh, coaches and consultants 
Yeah. Not that they are teaching me anything I don't know, right? It's not a how-to issue anymore for me. It's an execution sure. issue. And I'll spend the money and they have to sit down with me for that hour and watch me execute in real time. Scott and I have Great. created Light School for our community strictly to solve this issue because we had a course that 97% of people wouldn't do. Dude. Okay. Sorry, but our I'm coaching gonna... students are doing <laughs> So we're like, you know what? Screw it. Let's just skip to the good stuff. I couldn't agree with you more. Scott, do you agree? I agree. I, th I think that, uh, I, I mean, I think it, I think that, uh, that that solves the problem. It solves the problem, right? It's like, and the only thing is, <laughs> don't, don't draw too many mics, man. You won't get, they're expensive. Um, but, <laughs> but so uh, the thing is, the thing about, um, about it is that it's, it's funny how uh, it's hard. So the only American acceptable person of this nature is your personal trainer. The, the guy who trains you to work out, right? It's not about workout. Everybody knows that. It's about going to the gym. Um, and then what you just said blows my mind every fucking time. That out of the, um, the amount of people who will buy, it's like surprisingly easy to sell a $1,000 course. It's surprisingly difficult to get people to open up day two after they paid $1,000. Mind boggling. It doesn't make any sense, right? It doesn't make any sense. And you just said 97%. That's the rate of people who is that finishing the course because I would be impressed. No, that's failure rate. That's someone you know, who invests a thousand dollars and won't take action. It's crazy. Ninety-seven percent. So we flipped it. We said, "Look, if you want to do this, you're going to come on an eight-week course, and we're going to watch you do it in real time." Mm -hmm. And it's like, the way I, the way I always feel about these things are like, okay, if if like a few people don't execute our product that I sell, then it's their fault. But if ninety-seven percent of people don't execute our product that I sell, it's my fault. At some point, it's my fault, right? It's the person who makes it small. Um, otherwise, anyway, so I thought to myself, okay, how do I get myself to write down stuff? How do I get myself to just sit down and write? And I said, maybe if someone sits down next to me, it'll make it happen. So I wrote this blog post about how I pulled this off. I hired somebody on Craigslist. Her job was to sit down next to me and watch me all day. And every time I got off task, she would slap me in the face. And I wrote a blog and I, I hired this person on Craigslist for eight bucks an hour. It took me about 30 minutes until I got 30 different people asking for the job. Uh, hired to sit down next to me. And in two weeks, I wrote as much as I typically write in four months. I'm sorry, in like two days, I wrote as much as I typically write in four months. In two weeks, I wrote as much as I'd like to write in four months. Okay. Because um, of course, it just made sense. She was sitting there, she broke through the inertia, I pre committed. And then once you're in it, it's no longer like a battle. And then she's not a slapper anymore. And then you turn over to her, and like, how does this sound? Did you look up an image for me while I type this up? I'm going to work on the next post. Could you put this in WordPress? It becomes like a, a, a friendship and not a battle anymore after the first couple seconds. It's the same as a personal trainer. Um, so Are, I you married? Are you married? No. Oh, because my wife would just slap me, slap me up if I get off task. For exactly, my, wife, right? my wife would love this job. <laughs> yeah. yeah. My I'll children would love this job. Right? <laughs> it's bad. You'd be surprised the number of people who say, oh, I'll do this for you. And then they just – as soon as you're like, I'm serious, I'll pay you. They don't show up. Uh, so anyway, so anyway I, I did this. I, I hired for a couple of weeks. Uh, I had insane results. I wrote a blog post about this. The blog post went nutty viral. It was in like 150 different news sources in like 75 countries. Uh, and I was like famous for a couple of days. And then I said to myself, I, I was talking to a friend of mine after the, the fame died down. And I was like, yo, we should make a dog shock collar that shocks me every time I go to Facebook that would get hella pressed. Uh, I'm from Northern California, so we say hello. And um, he's like, yo, let's go to Radio Shack. <laughs> so we did. We went to Radio Shack. Uh, we bought like an Arduino and a dog shock collar. And we re like he was smarter than I was at hardware. He rewired the remote control. So every time I went on Facebook, it closed the circuit and it zapped me. And I made this video. And the video is hilarious. And I was about to post it online. And then I said to myself, huh, this is actually really interesting. There's a million wearables out there tracking what we do, but this one's actually changing what I do. Maybe there's something there. And that was the core of Pavlock, a wearable device that uh, I invented uh, that's been out for about, we started the company three years ago. It's been shipping for about a year. Um, it's a wearable device that at its core is very simple. It vibrates, it can beep, and it can release an electrical impulse at variable strengths that at low levels and different frequencies can feel like a pleasurable squeeze or a tap and at higher levels can feel like a powerful shock. 
And we found that by uh, using that in the right way, I could, we could help people adjust their behavior in massive uh, and change their behavior for good. I, I'm sold. I, I'd already heard of Pavlock um, oh, no, before we guys. booked you on the podcast. So um, I'm definitely sold. But uh, we're at that point now, Manish, where we're going to ask you for your tip of the week, a website, a resource, a book, something right, actionable where the art of passive income listeners can go right now, improve their businesses, improve their lives. This has been a phenomenal podcast, by the way. What do you got for me, Manish? I mean, I'm not right. me and Scott. All right, tip of the week? Yeah. All right, well, it'll come back to everything. All right, obviously, number one, get a padlock. Just kidding. I, I, my number one tip of the week, uh, I'm sorry. I just, I just want to- told you not to take oh, my- Shit, no, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. Let me pull back. I'm, I'm, I'm going to pull back. All right, my number one tip of the week is don't, like, whenever you find yourself uncomfortable, feeling like you're- not doing something you're good at. Don't feel broken, but instead take a step back and think about your personality. And okay, so where, where can we go to get that personality test? So all of these personality tests online are, 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 are problematic. Um, the best book I found, it's very simple. It's called The Art of Speed Reading People. It's about how to identify other people's personality types rapidly, but most importantly, your own. The Art of Speed Reading People is a great book that um, I really recommend people think about. I really think that people should take a step back and think about personality types. It's a really big deal. I'm buying it right now. Great. Great tip. Um, Scott Todd, what's your tip of the week? I can't hear you. Scott, we lost you there. Oh, how about now? Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Got it. Sorry about that. I've been should, I get, should I get this on Audible or should I get the, should the actual book, Manish? Uh, I'd get the book. I'd get the book. This was like exercises and stuff. Okay. All right, so I've been I've been playing with a new uh, a new smart notebook online. It's like an Evernote, if you will, that uh, it it learns from your interaction. So think of uh, AI, but in your Evernote type of notebook to help you to it begins to collaborate with you and show you things. Check it out, notebook.ai, Mark. It's oh, fun. okay, because I, I was doing Notion.ai, notebook.ai. Yeah, check it out. I just ordered on Amazon on, on one click the book. It's I love Amazon. What a yeah. G- what a g- yeah, I wish we had more time so I could talk to you about Amazon and their the difference between Amazon and uh, and Apple from like an organizational standpoint and personality well, types. Why, 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 why don't you come back, back Manish? Because I, I anytime, I really- man. Anytime. I love talking. <laughs> all right. Notebook. So all right, your digital What's notebook this? is here. Notebook that grows with your ideas and collaborates back with you. Cool. This is cool. Yeah. Check it out. It's it's fun to play with. All right, did you did you get it? I'm downloading it right now. Yeah. All right, get started. I'm di- I'm getting it right now. I'm playing with it. All right, awesome. Well, this is great. Wait, wait, what's your what's yours? Did you already say it, or did I, I I I might have disappeared when you when you told it? No, he's gotta give it. All right. Okay, so notebook.ai. Mark, don't forget to give your tip of the week. Oh yeah, Manish. Whatever. <laughs> This, this is the, I'll tell you what, I'm not going to give my tip until you actually um, do some type of uh, shock to yourself. For taking well, the week. Uh, in fact, I'll let all of your readers do it as well. If you go to pavlock.com forward slash shock Manish, anybody at any time can shock me at any time. Enjoy it. Okay. So my tip of the week awesome. is pavlock.com. It's safe. It's been tested. You can try it. And you know what I love about this, Manish? is you have a six-month guarantee. That is a crazy guarantee. But what's awesome about this is that you've got such confidence in it because you said you should see results in five days. Choose the habit you want to change. Wear your Pavlock throughout the day. Pavlock can automatically and manually deliver stimulus when you engage in your bad habit. Your brain associates the stimulus with the bad habit, creating an aversion. Don't want to, take, you don't want to eat that sugar? Zip. Don't want to sleep in again? Zip. But I mean, you know, quit smoking, zip, stop nail biting. I mean, it's, it's the, the applications it's are crazy. Crazy. It's crazy. And the craziest thing is that it's one of those things that like, it's, it's actually kind of obvious. It's even like been used in America and was pretty common in the past, but it disappeared because of social reasons. So it's like one of those things that blows my mind. Um, well, I'm, I'm going to get five like, for everyone so, in my family. Yeah. And one of the craziest things about this. And um, so 
our cup. So I don't know if we're going too far over. If I'm, well, I've got another podcast in one minute, but let's go. We can, let's I'll, go. I'll close okay. it up. The craziest thing that blows my mind or that I'm trying to get across is that our company is hyper focused on not believing in money. Money is not at all the thing that motivates us whatsoever. Um, and so that's why we have a, like the average habit breaks within five to seven days. Uh, when you follow our five day program, it, it creates a pavlovian living association, but the return policy is six months. All we ask is, and that, that means that you can break your habit. You can quit smoking, quit nail biting, and you can send it back for full, full refund. And we do not mind. The only thing we ask is that if you do that, please let us know your success story that you broke the habit. We will not be like feeling bad about the fact that you took our, took our product and didn't pay us. It's just about understanding the success of how the product works. I love it. Well, I, I'm, I'm buying five because I've got lots of people, <laughs> including myself, that, you know, these little annoying things I want to change about them. Like, you know, it doesn't have to be painful. It can just be just a little stimulus, right? Yeah, uh, yeah just, a little. Just, just a little squeeze, just, just an awareness of it. So um, I think it's going to be great. And then I'll get it for all my team members. And uh, you got a Slack integration. If yeah. people don't pay attention, my forward slash Pavlog zap. 100%. Listen to me. <laughs> yeah, they do. Exactly. <laughs> so this is great. Manish, we'll have you back because we have lots more to talk about. Awesome. Um, awesome. I do want to remind the listeners, like the only way we're going to get the quality of guests like a Manish Sethi from pavlok.com. And it's P-A-V-L-O-K.com. It's like Pavlov with a K. Pavlov with a K is to subscribe, rate, and view the podcast. So um, please do so. Learn more about me. Go to thelandgeek.com. Download for free the Passive Income Blueprint. If you have not registered for the web class, which is free, regarding flight school, it's all about what we just talked about. It's all about taking action and getting results. And look, if you're not automating, automating your Craigslist postings, I don't know why you're not. Go to postingdomination.com forward slash thelandgeek. Go to landmoto.com forward slash wholesale. Get yourself some wholesale land. Learn more about Scott Todd at scotttodd.net. Scott, are we good? Oh, Scott, you're, you're on mute. What, I don't know why that keeps happening. We are great. We're good. Manisha, are we good? I think we're awesome. It was a pleasure. Thanks again. Um, and uh, we'll see everybody next time. Let freedom, freedom ring. ring. Thanks, Manish. Thanks. Sorry, I didn't know I was supposed to jump in on that. It's okay. <laughs> we're, still, we're still trying to work on it. Thanks. <laughs>